All right, class, welcome to our literature subject. And we finished uh, King Arthur uh, last week. And so this week we are gonna be diving into Robin Hood. I really hope you enjoyed King Arthur. I definitely did. It was an awesome story. I think a lot of cool values and, and lessons to be learned. I also was growing out my mustache because of all the cool, especially Sir Lancelot, which was you know obviously the best knight, had a mustache. And if we look at our cover with Robin Hood, it looks like Robin Hood might have a beard. So maybe I'll have to start growing my beard out. I don't know. You guys let me know. Um, I'm just messing around. So what we're going to do, I'm going to divide this first week's reading into two parts. Today we're going to be talking about just introducing Robin Hood, read the introduction and the first two chapters. And then I'll be posting a video that will be chapters three through five. And that will be your chapters for the week. We are doing chapters from the beginning to chapter five. And remember, um, I know that sometimes reading is um, time consuming. Sometimes it's hard. And that's why I'm putting these videos into two parts because reading for an hour straight is a little difficult for me, okay? So you can just set a goal, maybe to do a chapter a day. Um, that would be Monday through Friday. And then um, you'll you'll be done, right? So you don't have to do a whole lot each day. The key is to do a little bit each day that keeps you on track, all right? Um, I mean, that's that's one way. If reading it all at once, it works for you, that's fine. You just gotta do what works for you, okay? Some of you guys are doing great and are on top of things, and some of you guys are just a little bit behind and, and may be struggling, and that's fine. The key is to be disciplined and figure out a good schedule that works for you to get caught up and stay caught up, all right? So if that means do your assignments for one class and then take a break, you know, eat some lunch, uh, maybe watch a show or, or play a game and then get back into schoolwork, that's totally fine. You know, sometimes you gotta take a break. So set a schedule, be disciplined and stick to it. And I promise you, you will stay on top of things. You will get caught up. And then Thanksgiving is coming in about uh, two weeks, right? really coming up really quick so I want you guys to enjoy your Thanksgiving break not worry about doing schoolwork okay so do whatever you can do what you need to do to stay on top of things and get caught up all right enough of that let's get uh, into Robin Hood right I know that's why you guys are clicking on this video and watching so let's get into Robin Hood and a good thing to do when we get a book that we haven't read before and maybe you have read before is to look you know through front pages and the cover and that gives us you know a great um, idea of what the story is going to be about the, the setting that it's going to be placed in uh, maybe get to know about about the characters all right so looking at the cover well it looks like our main feature this main guy is probably Robin Hood those that know the story We've got his hood on Robin Hood looks like we got some kings and queens maybe some princes and uh, Prince, princesses and princes back here. Um, he has a bow and his arrow. Maybe he's doing, maybe he's at like an archery game or something. Looks like he's close to the castle. All right. So I wonder what he's doing there. And then we learn that Robin Hood and his merry outlaws. So we have some outlaws in here. His core classics. Um, and then we have our table of contents. So we can look through and look at the different titles of the chapters. We have Robin Hood, how Robin Hood became an outlaw. So what is Robin, gonna, Robin Hood gonna do to become an outlaw? Um, we can go scroll down, how Little John entered the Sheriff's service. service. So we're gonna learn about a character named Little John entering the Sheriff's service. Let's see how Robin Hood met some people, Will Scarlet and Friar Tuck. How Robin Hood fought Guy of Gisborne. How a beggar filled the public eye. How the outlaw shot in King Harry's tournament. All right, so we're gonna learn about outlaws. Uh, Robin Hood is gonna be a great ethical story, right? Um, we're gonna learn a lot about virtues and values during Robin Hood, all right? And so reading those titles kind of gives us a, a glance of what we're gonna learn about and the different stories that we, we'll listen to, okay? So let's read the introduction. An introduction is very important. It gives us, you know, the foundation for the story. Those that didn't read the introduction for King Arthur, some of it might have not made sense because there was a lot of things that King Merlin or that Merlin 
prophesied and how things came about that was the foundation for the story of King Arthur. So let's read the introduction for Robin Hood to give us the foundation, the setting for Robin Hood. We're going to jump into the story with Robin Hood, right? Okay, so introduction. And I'm going to, as I read this, um, I'm going to take this off, okay, so we can just focus on the words and the story. Two heroes from the Middle Ages still stir our imaginations. One is King Arthur with his Knights of the Round Table, which we just read. The other is Robin Hood with his band of forest outlaws. King Arthur and his knights live at court. They go into the dark woods when they are after adventure, but forests hold no danger for Robin Hood and his men. Sherwood Forest is their home, and they feel safe there. The King Arthur stories tell of the mighty noblemen who rule. The Robin Hood stories tell of common men who defy their masters and rule themselves. All right, so are we going to learn about defined masters and defined rules? And is that good or bad? The ethical, right? Was Robin Hood a real person? Probably not. But English records from the Middle Ages do tell of desperate criminals who ran into the woods to hide from the law and lived in bands or groups of people, robbing those who passed through their gloomy glens. The Robin Hood stories come to us from ballads popular in the 13th century. A ballad is a song or poem that usually tells a story. Ballads have rhyming four-line stanzas, sometimes followed by a chorus. You'll find verses from these old ballads introducing each chapter of our story. The Robin Hood ballad, <clears throat> sorry, the Robin Hood ballads were also performed as skits. In the 1400s, towns across England held games and plays in Robin Hood's name. In early summer, a procession of villagers led by someone dressed as Robin Hood went to a neighboring village where they performed a skit. Usually it showed how Robin Hood made a daring rescue. They collected money for their performances and spent it on such things as road repair. But I just want to pause really quick. We're going to learn about how these, we just, well, we just barely listened to, and we're going to learn more about it, how these people would go into the forest and they would rob um, people, right? It's kind of interesting to hear about how this was a story or a ballad, right, that was performed by people in the Middle Ages but they didn't rob those that they were performing, right? The, those that were performing got money from those that were watching it. I just think it's kind of interesting that they're performing a story that talks about people robbing those, and then those that are performing the actual skit didn't rob those that were in attendance. Because maybe we'll learn and we'll, we'll discuss about how ethical the things that Robin Hood did. Okay, so Robin Hood became a popular hero because he represented the ordinary person's desire to be treated fairly. Medieval society had three ranks, the nobility, the men of the church, and lastly, common folk. The nobles were responsible for worldly wo uh, welfare and the churchmen for spiritual welfare. That is, the duty of the nobility was to defend Christian lands with their lives. The duty of the clergy was to shepherd souls toward heaven and plead for God's blessings. The duty of common men was to keep everyone fed. Kind of like we're reading in medieval um, Europe, the serfs, their, their, their main goal or their, their main purpose of their work was to work in the fields and to provide the things, necessities to the other people in the estate or manors. So that's similar to what we just read. As the leaders of Christianity, nobles and clergy should have acted in Christian ways toward the common people. They should have treated them with love, charity, and goodness, and of course, according to the law. But what powerful men declare to be law is not necessarily what either religious faith or fair reasoning would call justice. Thus, it often happened that the common people hated their local authorities and grumbled against anyone who enjoyed luxuries. Robin Hood rejects unjust laws, seeing them as the will of wicked and greedy men. To get away from the power of the sheriff and the bishop, Robin Hood and his outlaws live outdoors in Sherwood Forest. Their warm fellowship is based on equality, which is a great thing, right? The outlaws choose Robin as their chief because his daring wins. 
sorry, because his daring wins their mad, mad, sorry guys. The outlaws choose Robin as their chief because his daring wins their uh, admiration and loyalty, right? So his his attitude and his willing to take risk wins their admiration or their um, they admire him, right? And their loyalty. They believe they obey a higher law than the sheriff's law, one that respects the dignity of every person. They feel justified in resisting their rulers because their rulers are not following that higher law. Robin Hood is devoted to the Virgin Mary, for example, but not to the church because church leaders were not following their own teachings. He honors the idea of his king, but he believes the king's deer really belong to the hungriest poor folk. He does not object to wealth or rank, but to the wrong use of those advantages. His remedy for the suffering of the weak is to steal from the rich to give to the poor. Only those whose wealth is unearned need to fear Robin on his outlaw or his outlaws. Even then, rich travelers who tell Robin the truth get to keep some money. Those who lie lose it all. Proving that many distinctions society makes between the high and the low ranks are false. Robin Hood shows that chivalry, the medieval code of courtesy and courage that guided behavior at King Arthur's court, can guide a common man's life as well. Robin Hood holds court in the forest just as King Arthur does at Camelot. Just as chivalry required every knight to defend and respect every woman, Robin Hood forbids any of his outlaws ever to hurt a woman, or any man if a woman is pre present. He demands loyalty, honesty, and courage from each man, just as Arthur, sorry, just as Arthur expects from his knights. Robin's word is his bond, even to his enemies, and he is careful never to tell lies, even as he plays tricks. He tells by the rules of honor as much as he does Sir Lancelot, the most illustrious knight of King Arthur's round table. Robin is a natural leader, bold and shrewd, but he is not the best of his band at anything except archery. To the outlaws of Sherwood Force, skill at archery is their special badge. Their long bows stood about six feet tall and could send an arrow the length of three football fields. Oh, 300 yards and six feet tall is just right taller than me at close range those arrows could even go through armor english archers became famous throughout europe after their longbows won victories against the french at the battles of crèche and angincourt in the hundred years war english kings understood the value of expert archers and held tournaments to encourage the skill robin could not resist the chance a tournament gives to show his amazing aim, even though to go means he risks hanging. This gallant spirit, equal to any of King Arthur's knights and his common sense fairness, have made Robin Hood our favorite outlaw for more than 700 years. Ah, Charlottesville, Virginia, by E.D. Hirsch, Jr. I lived right by Charlottesville for a long time, about seven years. Okay, that was our introduction, and this shows probably look better in your book, which you guys should all have a copy of. You have Nottingham right above England, and then Sherwood Forest, which was right above um, Nottingham. And we have London in England, and then down here is Paris, France. Okay, so that gives us a little bit where this story takes place. Okay, How Robin Hood Became an Outlaw, the first chapter. Listen and hearken, gentlemen, that be of freeborn blood, I shall tell you of a good yeoman. His name was Robin Hood. Robin was a proud outlaw. While he, while as he walked on the ground, so courteous an outlaw as he was one, was never, never none else found. Okay, so a yeoman is a man who works his own small farm. Okay, and there was our first stanza. In the days of King Harry, the second of England, there were certain forests in the north country set aside for the king's hunting. Any man who shot a deer in them faced the penalty of death. These forests were guarded by the king's foresters, the chief of whom in each wood was equal in authority to the sheriff in his walled town, or even to a bishop in his abbey. We've learned about abbeys. Abbey is several buildings, including a church where men or women lived a religious life, so either monks or nuns. 
One of the greatest of the royal hunting preserves was Sherwood Forest, near the town of Nottingham. Here for some years lived one Hugh Fitzsooth as head forester, with his wife and little son, Robert. The boy had been born in Loxley town in the year of 1160, Brit records say, and was often called Loxley or Rob of Loxley. He was a handsome, well-built boy, and as soon as he was strong enough to walk, his chief delight was to go with his father into the forest. As soon as his right arm grew strong enough, he learned to draw the long bow and shoot a true arrow. All right, so we talked about a long bow. Well, let's, <clears throat> let's get a little reminder. A long bow is a wooden bow about six feet long. It was so effective that English archers using them defeated mounted French knights in the two major battles of the Hundred Years' War, Crèche and Angincourt. Okay, going back. On winter evenings, his greatest joy was to hear his father tell of Will O. the Green, the bold outlaw who for many summers defied the king's foresters and feasted with his men upon the king's deer. And on stormy days, the boy learned to whittle out a straight shaft for the longbow and fit it with gray goose feathers. His loving mother sighed when she saw the boy's face light up at these woodland tales. She was of gentle birth and had hoped to see her son famous at the king's court or in the bishop's abbey. Okay, let's learn what a gentle birth is. A gentle birth is someone born in the gentry, landholders lower than the highest class, the nobility. Okay. So not the highest class, not born to the highest class, but um, right below the, the highest class. So continue to read right here at the bottom, she taught. She taught him to read and to write, to lift his cap gracefully, and to answer directly and truthfully, both lord and peasant, so to be respectful. But the boy, although he took kindly to these lessons, was the happiest when he had his beloved bow in hand and wandered freely, listening to the murmur of the trees. Rob had two playmates in those early days. One was Will Gamewell, his father's brother's son, so his cousin, who lived at Gamewell Lodge, very near Nottingham Town. The other was Marion Fitzwalter, only child of the Earl of Huntingdon, whose castle could be seen from the top of one of the tall trees in Sherwood. One more than one bright day, Rob's white signal from this tree told Marion that he waited here there, waited her there, awaited her there. Sorry, guys. Let me reread that. One more than one bright day, Rob's white signal from this tree told Marion that he awaited her there. Rob did not visit her at the castle. His father and her father were enemies. Some people whispered that Hugh Fitzsooth was the rightful Earl of Huntingdon, but that he had been cheated out of his lands by Fitzwalter, who had won the king's favor by a crusade to the Holy Land. All right, let's uh, skip forward for a second and learn what a crusade is. A crusade is... The War of the Cross, a series of wars from 1096 to 1291 in which European Christians fought Muslims to control Jerusalem and the Holy, Hand, the Holy Land. Okay, so um, Earl uh, Hugh thought he was cheated out by Fitzwalter, who had won the king's favor after the crusade to the Holy Land. But Rob or Marion cared little for this hatred. However, it had begun. They knew that they, the great greenwood was open to them, and it was full of the scent of flowers and the song of birds. Days of youth passed all too swiftly, and the tournament sorry, days of youth passed all too swiftly, and troubled skies came all too soon. Rob's father had two other enemies besides Fitzwalter, the lean sheriff of Nottingham and the fat bishop of Hereford. Hereford. These three enemies one day got to the king's ear and whispered in it to such evil purpose that the king removed Hugh Fitzsooth from his post of king's forester. He and his wife and Rob, then a youth of nineteen, were evicted on a cold winter's evening, empty-handed without warning. The sheriff arrested the forester for treason, of which, poor man, he was as guiltless as you or I, and carried him to Nottingham jail. So, what was treason? Treason, the crime of betraying your country or trying to overthrow his government. So, 
um, these enemies of Hugh, um, Rob's father, um, spoke lies to the king of treason. So the king listened and uh, the sh had the sheriff arrest Hugh, or Rob's father, um, for treason and put him in the Nottingham jail. Continue to read Rob and his mother. Rob and his mother stayed overnight in the jail also, but the next morning they were roughly told to go about their business. They turned for shelter to their only kinsman, Squire George of Gamewell, who kindly took them in. But the shock in the winter night's journey proved too much for Rob's mother. She had not been strong for some time before leaving the forest. In less than two months, she was no more. Rob felt as though his heart was broken, but scarcely had the first spring flowers begun to blossom upon her grave when he had another cr crushing blow, the loss of his father. That brave man died in prison before his accusers could agree upon the charges on which he was to be brought to trial. Two years passed by. Rob's cousin Will was away at school, and Marion's father, who had learned of her friendship with Rob, had sent his daughter to the court of Queen Eleanor. So these years were lonely ones to the orphan lad. The bluff old squire was kind to him, but secretly could not understand somehow someone who went about brooding as though seeking for something he had lost. So, like, continued to, uh, like, sulk or be sad. The truth is that Rob missed his old life in the forest, no less than his mother's gentleness and his father's companionship. Every time he twanged the string of the long bow against his shoulder and heard the gray goose shaft sing, it told him of the hap of happy days that he could not bring back. One morning, as Rob came in to breakfast, his uncle greeted him with, I have news for you, Rob, my lad. And the hearty old squire sat his pewter tankard of ale down with a crash. What may that be, Uncle Gamewell? asked the young man. Here is a chance to exercise your good long bow and win a pretty, pretty prize. The fair is on at Nottingham, and the sheriff proclaims an archer's tournament. The best fellows are to have places with the king's foresters, and the one who shoots straightest of all win will win a golden arrow, a useless babble, but just the thing for your lady love. Eh, Rob, my boy? The squire laughed and whacked the table again with his tankard. Rob's eyes sparkled. "'Tis indeed we're shooting for, uncle,' he said. "'And a place among the foresters is what I have long desired. "'Will you let me try?' "'To be sure,' rejoined his uncle. "'I know that your good mother would want me to make a clerk of you, "'but I see very well that the green wood is where you will pass your days. "'So here's luck to you.' "'And the huge tankard came down a third time. "'One fine morning, a few days after, "'Rob passed briskly and gaily through Sherwood Forest to Nottingham.' His hopes were high, and he had no enemy in the, wide, in the wide world. But it was the very last morning in all his life when he lacked an enemy. As he went on his way, whistling, he came suddenly upon a group of foresters beneath the spreading branches of an oak tree. They had a meat pie and were, and were washing down huge slices of it with brown ale. When he glanced at the leader, Rob knew at once that he had found an enemy. It was the man who had taken his father's place as head forester and roughly turned his mother out in the snow. But Robin said not a word, for good or bad, and would have passed on his way. But this man, clearing his throat with a big gulp of ale, bellowed out, My word, here is a pretty little archer. Where are you going, lad, with that toy bow and arrows? To shoot at Nottingham Fair? Ho, 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 ho. Rob flushed, for he was very proud of his shooting. My bow is as good as yours, he answered. My shafts will carry as straight and as far, so I'll not take lessons from any of you. They laughed again loudly at this, and the leader said with a frown, Show us your skill, and if you can hit the mark, here's twenty silver pennies for you. But if you miss, you are in for a sound beating for your sassiness. Pick your own target, said Rob in a rage. I'll lay my head against that purse that I can hit it. As you say, answered the forester angry. Your head, if you cannot hit my target. Now a little rise in the wood, a herd of deer came by grazing, a full hundred yards away. They were the king's deer, but at that distance seemed safe from any harm. The head forester pointed to them. If your young arm could send a shaft for half that distance, I'd shoot with you. Done, cried Rob. My head against twenty pennies, 
all caused the fine fellow and the lead of them to breathe his last. And without more ado, he tried the string of his bow, placed a shaft on it, and drew it to his ear. A moment later, the quivering string sang death as the shaft whistled across the glade. Then the leader of the herd leaped high in his tracks and fell prone, straining the turf with his heart's blood. A murmur of amazement swept through the foresters, and then a growl of rage. He who made the wager was angriest of all. Do you know what you have done? he said. You have killed the king's deer. By the laws of King Harry, you should pay with your head. Talk not of the pennies, but get gone straight, and let me not look upon your face again. Rob's blood boiled, and he said rashly, I have looked upon your face once too often already, you who wear my father's shoes. And with this he turned and walked away. The forester heard these parting words and cursed. Red with rage, he seized his bow and without warning launched an arrow at Rob. Luckily for Rob, the forester's foot turned on a twig at the critical instant. As it was, the arrow whistled by his ear so closely that it took a stray strand of his hair with it. Rob turned upon his attacker, now forty yards away. Ha, said he, you do not shoot as straight as I. For all of your bravado, take this from the toy bow. Straight flew his answering shaft. The head forester gave one cry, then fell face downward and lay still. His life avenged the death of Rob's father, but Rob was now outlawed. Forward he ran through the forest, before the band could gather their scattered wits, and the swaying trees of the great greenwood seemed to open their arms to welcome him home. Later that same day, Rob paused, hungry and weary, at the cottage of a poor widow who lived on the outskirts of the forest. This widow had often greeted him kindly in his boyhood days, given him things to eat and drink, so he boldly entered her door. The old woman was indeed glad to see him. She baked him cakes and had him rest and tell his story. Then she shook her head. An evil wind blows through Sherwood, she said. The poor are plundered and the rich ride over their bodies. My three sons have been outlawed for shooting the king's deer to keep us from starving, and they now hid in the woods. They tell me that forty good men are hiding with them. Where are they? cried Rob. By my faith, I will join them. Nay, nay, replied the old woman at first, but when she saw that there was no other way, she said, My sons will visit me tonight. Stay here and see them if you must. So Rob stayed to the widow's sons. <clears throat> Sorry. So Rob stayed to see the widow's sons that night, for they, for they were the men after his own heart. And when they found that his mood was with them, they made him swear an oath of loyalty and told him the hideaway of the band, a place he knew very well. Finally, one of them said, But the band lacks a leader, one who can use his head as well as his hands. So we agreed that he who has skill enough to go to Nottingham as an outlaw and win the prize at archery shall be our chief. Rob sprang to his feet. I had started to that same fair, he cried. All the foresters and all the sheriff's men in Christendom shall not stand between me and the center of their target. His eye flashed with such fire that the three brothers seized his hand and shouted, A Loxley, a Loxley, if you win the golden arrow, you shall be chief of outlaws in Sherwood Forest. So Rob began planning how he could disguise himself to go to Nottingham, for he knew that a price would be set on his head. As Rob foresaw in the marketplace, the sheriff of Nottingham posted um, a reward of 200 pounds for the capture, dead or alive, of one Robert Fitzsooth, outlaw. And the crowd thronging, thronging the streets upon that busy fair day often paused to read the notice and talk together about the death of the head forester. But a fair day brought up so many other things to talk about the reward. That reward was forgotten for the time being and only the foresters and the sheriff's men watched the gates closely. The great event of the day came in the afternoon. It was the archer's contest for the golden arrow, and twenty men stepped forward to shoot. Among them was a beggar, a sorry-looking fellow, with leggings of different colors and brown scratched face and hands. Over a shock of light brown hair he had, a hood drawn, like that of the monk of a monk. Slowly he limped to his place in the line, while the mob shouted mock mockery, but the contest was open to all comers, so no man could stop him. Besides Rob, for it was he who dressed as a beggar, stood a muscular fellow with one eye hidden by a green bandage. The crowd also cheered him. Oh, sorry. The crowd also jeered him, 
but he passed them by with indifference. So they were also mocking this guy with the one eye hidden. All the gentry and the people of the surrounding country were gathered in eager expectancy. The central box contained the lean but proud sheriff, his bejeweled wife, and their daughter, who, it was openly hinted, was hoping to receive the golden arrow from the victor, and so be crowned queen of the day. Next to the sheriff's box was one occupied by the fat bishop of Hereford. On the other side was a box where sat a girl whose dark hair, dark eyes, and fair features caused Rob's heart to leap. Maid Marian! She had come up for a visit from the Queen's Court at London, and now sat by her father, the Earl of Huntingdon. The sight of her sweet face multiplied Rob's determination a hundred times. He felt his muscles tightening, yet despite this, he, his ear throbbed, making him quake in a most strange way. Then the trumpet sounded and the crowd became silent while the herald announced the rules of the contest. It was open to all comers. The first target was to be placed 30 yards away, and all those who hit the, its center were allowed to shoot at the second target, placed 10 yards farther off. The third target was to be moved yet farther until the winner was proved. The winner was to receive the golden arrow and place with the king's foresters. He would also crown the queen of the day. The trumpet sounded again, and the archers prepared to shoot. 12 out of the 20 contests Contestants reached their inner circle. So 12 out of 20, which would be three fifths, uh, reached the first circle. Rob shot six in the line and hit the center squarely. He heard an approving grunt from the man with the green eye patch, who shot next and carelessly, yet true to the bull's eye. The mob cheered and yelled themselves hoarse at even his marksmanship. The trumpet sounded again, and a new target was set up 40 yards away. The first three arches, archers again struck true amid loud applause, for they were expected to win. Indeed, it was whispered that each was backed by one of the three dignitaries of the day, the sheriff, the bishop, and the earl. The fourth and fifth archers barely grazed the center. Rob fitted his arrow quietly and with confidence sped it straight toward the shiny circle. The beggar! yelled the crowd. Another bullseye for the beggar! In truth, his shaft was nearer the center than any of the others, but it was not so near that blinder as the mob had nicknamed his neighbor did not place his shaft just within the mark. Again, the crowd cheered wildly, wildly, Shouting such as this was not seen every day. Sorry, shooting such as this was not seen every day. The other archers in this round missed one after another. They dropped moodily back while the trumpet sounded for the third round, and the target was set up 50 yards distance. You draw a good bow, said Rob's comrade to him, and the interval allowed for the rest. Do you wish me to shoot first this time? Nay, said Rob. But you are a good fellow to offer, and if I do not win, I hope you can keep the prize from these strutters. And he nodded scornfully to the three other archers, who were surrounded by their admirers. Then his eye wandered toward Maid Marian's booth. She had been watching him, it seemed, for their eyes met, then she looked away. Blinders! Quick eye followed Rob's. A fair maid that, he said smiling, and one more worthy of the golden arrow than the sheriff's proud daughter. Rob looked at him swiftly, but saw only kindness in his glance. You are a shrewd fellow, and I like you well, was all he said. Now the archers prepared to shoot again. The target seemed hardly larger than the inner ring had looked at the first trial. The first three sped their shafts, and though they were good shots, they only grazed the inner circle. Rob took his turn with some worry. Some scattered clouds overhead made the, lighting, the light uncertain, and a wind gusted across the range. His eyes wandered for a brief moment to the box where the dark-eyed girl sat. His heart leaped. She met his glance and smiled at him. And in that moment, he felt that she knew him despite his disguise and looked to him to keep the honor of old Sherwood. He drew his bow firmly, taking advantage of a lull in the breeze launched the arrow straight and true to the center of the target. The beggar! A bullseye! A bullseye! yelled the fickle mob. 
Can you beat that, Blinder? The last archer smiled scornfully, drew his bow with ease and grace, and, without seeming to study the course, released the winged arrow. All eyes followed its flight. A loud uproar broke forth when it hit just outside the center, grazing the shaft sent by Rob. The stranger made a gesture of surprise when his, eye, his own eyes showed the result to him, but saw his error. His error. He had not allowed for the wind, which carried the arrow to one side. Still, he was the first to congratulate Rob. I hope we may shoot again, he said. In truth, I do not care for the golden bauble and wish to win it to spite the sheriff. Now crown the lady of your choice. And turning suddenly, he, he was lost in the crowd before Rob could utter what was on his lips to say, that he hoped to shoot with him again. The herald summoned Rob to the sheriff's box to receive the prize. You are a curious, curious fellow, said the sheriff, biting his lip coldly. Yet you shoot well. What name do you go by? Marion sat near, listening intently. I am called Rob the Stroller, my lord sheriff, said the archer. Marion leaned back and smiled. Well, Rob the Stroller, with a little attention to your skin and clothes, you would not be so bad a man, said the sheriff. How do you like the idea of entering my service? Rob the Stroller has always been a free man, my lord, and desires no service. The sheriff's brow darkened. Yet for the sake of his daughter, he concealed his feelings. Rob the Stroller, said he, here is the golden arrow, which is meant for the best archer this day. You are awarded the prize. Bestow it worthily. At this point, the herald nudged Rob and half nodded his head toward the sheriff's daughter, who sat with a thin smile on her lips. But Rob took the arrow to the next box where Maid Marion sat. Lady, he said, pray accept this little pledge from a poor stroller who would devout himself to your service. I thanks to you, Rob in the Hood, he replied with a twinkle in her eye, and she placed the gleaming arrow in her hair. While the people shouted, The Queen! The Queen! The sheriff looked furiously at his ragged archer, who had refused his job, offer at a job, taken his prize without a word of thanks, and snubbed his daughter, who would have spoken, but his proud daughter restrained him. He called to his guard and told them to watch the beggar, but Rob had already lost himself in the crowd and was headed straight for the town gate. That evening, in a forest glade, a group of men, clad in leek and green, sat round a fire roasting venison. Suddenly, a twig cracked, and they sprang to their feet and seized their weapons. So Lincoln Green is a color of wool cloth once made in Lincoln, England. So this kind of cloth made from Lincoln, England is why it's called Lincoln Green. <clears throat> I look for the widow's son, a clear voice said, and I come alone. Instantly, the three men stepped forward. Rob, they cried, welcome to Sherwood Forest. And all the men greeted him, for they had heard his story. Then one of the widow's son, Stout Will, stepped forward and said, Comrades all, ye know that our band has sadly lacked a leader. We may have found that leader in this young man. And I and my brothers have told him that you would choose that one who would bring the sheriff to shame this day and capture his golden arrow. Is it not so? The band agreed, and Will turned to Rob. What news do you bring from Nottingham? Asked he. Rob laughed. To tell the truth, I brought the sheriff to shame for my own pleasure and won his golden arrow to boot. But as to the prize, you must take my word, for I gave it to a maid. Seeing the men doubted this, he continued, But I'll gladly join your band as a common archer, archer, for there are others older and perhaps more skilled than I. Then one stepped forward from the rest, a tall, swarthy man, and Rob recognized him as the man with the green patch, only it was now removed. Rob in the hood, for such the lady called you, said he, I can vouch for your tale. You shame the sheriff as I hope to do, and the golden arrow is indeed in fair hands. As to your shooting and mine, we must let future days decide. But here I will, but here, but here I will astutely declare that I will serve no other chief but you. Then Will astutely told the outlaws of Rob's deeds and gave him his hand in loyalty. The widow's sons did likewise, as did the other members, every one gladly, because Will astutely had there had heretofore been the truest bow in all the company. They toasted him with ale and hailed him as their leader by the name of Robin Hood. Right? Rob in the hood? Rob in hood? And he accepted that name because Maid Marian had said it. By the light of the campfire, the band exchanged signs and passwords. They gave Robin Hood a horn to blow to summon them. 
They swore also that while they might take money and goods from the unjust rich, they would aid the poor and help the and the helpless, and that they would harm no woman. They swore all these with solemn oaths while they feasted about the ruddy blaze under the greenwood tree. And this is how Robin Hood became an outlaw. All right, so that was chapter one. Let's do chapter two. Um, this is going on a little bit longer than I thought it would, but it's been a cool story. I hope you've been enjoying it. If you need to take a break, um, pause this video, come back, and then open up your book and follow along uh, with the book in hand or with just following along on the screen, okay? So we're gonna do chapter two for this video, and then like I said, I will do a part two for this first week that will have chapters three through five. So let us continue to read. Chapter two, how Robin Hood met Little John. Oh, here is my hand, the stranger replied. I'll serve you with all my whole heart. My name is Little John, a man of good metal. Never doubt me, for I'll play my part. His name shall be altered, said William Stutley, and I will his godfather be, prepare then a feast, and none of the least. For he will be merry, said he. Metal is an attitude of courage and endurance. All that summer, Robin Hood and his merry men roamed in Sherwood Forest, and the fame of their deeds spread abroad in the land. The sheriff of Nottingham raged over the outlaws, but all his traps and searches failed to catch them. The poor people first feared them, but when they found that Robin, Robin Hood's men meant them no harm, but took from the rich and gave to the poor, they began to have a great liking for them. The band increased till by the end of the summer, 80 men had sworn loyalty. But the quiet days seemed dull to Robin's adventurous spirit. One morning he rose and slung his quiver over his shoulder. His quiver is what holds the, oh, the, uh, the, the arrows. This fresh breeze stirs the blood, lads, said he, and I want to see what the world looks like in the direction of Nottingham. But you tarry behind in the borders of the forest within earshot of my bugle call. Thus saying, he strode merrily forward to the edge of the wood and paused there a moment, his agile body erect, his brown locks flowing, and his brown eyes watching the road. The highway was clear in the direction of the town, but at a bend in the road, he turned onto a path leading across a brook, a little stream, which made the way shorter and less open. As he approached the stream, he saw that it had become swollen by recent rains into a quiet torrent. The lodge footbridge was still there, but he had no sooner started across than he saw a tall stranger coming from the other side. Robin quickened his pace, and the stranger did likewise, each thinking to cross first. They met at the middle of the lodge, and neither would yield an inch. Give way, fellow, roared Robin. The stranger smiled. He was almost a head taller than Robin. Nay, he retorted, I give way only to a better man than myself. Give way, I say, repeated Robin, for I shall have to show you a better man. His opponent budged not an inch, but laughed loudly. Now, he said good-naturedly, I'll not move after hearing that speech, even if I might have before. I have sought this better man my whole life long, therefore show him to me. That will I write soon, said Robin. Stay here while I cut a cudgel like that you have been twiddling in your fingers. So saying, he leaped to his own bank again, laid aside his long bow and arrows, and cut a stout staff of oak, a good six feet in length. Still, it was a full foot shorter than his opponent's. Then back he came boldly. I do not mind telling you, fellow, said he, that an archer match would have been an easier way for me, but there are other tunes in England besides those an arrow sings. Then he whirled the staff above his head, so make ready for the tune I am about to play upon your ribs. One, two, three, roared the giant, striking at him instantly. Fortunately, Rob, fortunately for Robin, he was quicker. Sorry. Fortunately for Robin, he was quick and nimble, for the blow that grazed his shoulder would have flexed, would have felled an ox. Nevertheless, while swerving to avoid the stroke, Robin was preparing for his own, and back he came with a whack. Whack paired with the other. Whack, whack, whack. The fight was fast and furious. It was strength pitted against skill. 
The mighty blows of the stranger went whistling around Robin's ducking head, while his own swift undercuts gave the stranger an attack of indigestion. Yet each stood firmly in his place, not moving backward or forward, a foot for a good half hour. The giant's face was getting red, and his breath came snorting forth like a bull's. Robin dodged his blows lightly, then sprang in swiftly, unexpectedly, and gave the stranger a wicked blow upon the ribs. The stranger reeled and nearly fell, but regained his footing. By my life, you can hit hard, he gasped, he gasped, giving back a blow as he staggered. That blow was a lucky one. It caught Robin off his guard. His stick had rested a moment while he looked to see the giant topple into the water, when down came a whack on his head that dropped Robin neatly into the stream. The cool rushing current quickly brought him to his senses, but he was still so dazed that he groped blindly for the swaying reeds to pull him himself up on the bank. His opponent could not help laughing heartily, but he also thrust down his long staff to Robin, crying, Lay hold of that. Robin took hold and was hauled to dry land like a fish. He lay upon the warm bank for a while to regain his senses. Then he sat up and rubbed his head. By all the saints, said he, my head hums like a beehive on a summer morning. Then he picked up his horn, which lay near, and blew th three shrill notes that echoed among the trees. A moment of silence followed, then the rustling of leaves and crackling of twigs could be heard, and from the glade two dozen yeomen burst, all clad in Lincoln green like Robin, with Will Stutley and the widow's three sons at their head. Good master, cried Will Stutley, how is this? There is not a dry thread on you. This fellow would not let me pass the footbridge, replied Robin, and when I tickled him in the ribs, he answered with a pat on my head that sent me in the stream. Then shall the, he taste some of his own porridge, said Will. Seize him, lads. Nay, let him go free, said Robin. The fight was a fair one. Are you ready to quit? He continued, turning to the stranger with a twinkling eye. I am content, said the other, for I like you well and wish to know your name. My men, and even the sheriff of Nottingham, know me as Robin Hood, the outlaw. Then I am right sorrow. <clears throat> then I am right sorry that I beat you, exclaimed the man, for I was on my way to join your company. But now that I have used my staff on you, I fear you will not have me. Nay, never say it, cried Robin. I am glad you fell in with me, though I didn't did all the falling. As the others laughed, the two men clasped hands, and the strong friendship of a lifetime began. But you have not told us your name, said Rob, Robin. <clears throat> Where I came from, men call me John Little. Into your company, then, John Little, and welcome. All we ask is your whole mind and body and heart, even unto death. I give the bond of my life, said the tall man. Then Will Stutley, who loved a good joke, spoke up and said, The infant in our household must be christened, and I'll be his godfather. This stranger is so small a bone and muscle that his old name does not suit the purpose. Here Will paused long enough to fill a horn in the stream, and then he stood on tiptoe to splash the water on the giant. I christen you, Little John. At this, the men roared loud and long and loud. A bow and a full sheath of arrows for Little John, said Robin joyfully. Can you shoot as well as you fight with the staff, my friend? I have hit an ash twig at forty yards, said Little John. Thus chat chatting pleasantly, the band turned back into the woodland and toward their hideaway, where the trees were the thickest, the moss was the softest, and a secret path led to a cave that was both safe and a stronghold. And a stronghold is a fort. Here, under a mighty oak, they found the rest of the band with two fat does. And here they built a fire and sat down to the meat and ale, Robin Hood in the center with Will Stutley on the one hand and Little John on the other. Robin was happy with the days of adventures, venture, even though he had got a drubbing, for sore ribs and heads will heal. And it's not every day that one can find a friend as true as Little John. Okay. That chapter was a little bit quicker. It was kind of fun to meet John Little, who be became or was christened to become Little John. But that is that is it for today, okay, class? Or that is it for this video. Remember, there will be part two, which is chapters three through five. And try to just do a chapter a day if reading is not your favorite thing. If you love reading, you can read all of this at once and or get ahead. But make sure you are taking the time 
to stay on top of all of your subjects, okay? Make sure you're getting caught up and staying caught up with math, literacy, literature, which is Robin Hood right now, science and history, okay? Uh, math and literacy might take the longest. Uh, literature might take the next longest because it just takes a while to read. But history and science should be kind of short lessons, um, learn the material, do the assignments. And if you can balance and structure your day, schedule it so that you get all of your work done, get caught up, uh, things will go smoothly. I know it's tough to be at home doing school, but you have to set a schedule that's similar to school, right? So set a time maybe from 8 to 9, you're doing math, and then you know take a little break, and then 9.15 to 9.45, you do science, take a little break, and 10 to 11, you're doing literature, or literacy, and then take a break, and you know 11.15 to... 12 o'clock you're doing history and then you know take a lunch and then come back at one and you know do you know so on so forth make a schedule and stick to it every day and you will stay on top and and get on track if you're behind okay well that's the video you guys are awesome i will see you in part two of this robin hood reading